All right, welcome. Welcome to the continuation of chemistry. Chemistry, which we study because of its um, application to biology. And what we need to know some of the basics of chemistry. Um, we talked about um, atoms last time and how very, very small they are. It's interesting. We're, we're going to talk a bit later about how to determine a mole of any particular element or atom. And um, have you heard of Av Avogadro's number? Yeah, so Avogadro's number, which is the number of atoms you would find in a mole of a particular element. So uh, if it were carbon, for example, um, carbon, that would be approximately 12 grams. So in 12 grams of carbon, you would find Avogadro's number, which is, uh, is, is it six times 10 to the 23? Something like that, right? So if each atom were the size of a popcorn, it would cover Canada to a depth of nine kilometers. <laughs> That's how many atoms that is, <laughs> just a ton. So now we're going to, to look at uh, atoms coming together um, to form compounds, but also atoms in their pure form. So matter is anything that takes up space and has mass. And matter is made up of elements. And elements are substances that cannot be broken down into other substances by chemical reactions. So what kills me about chemistry is that here you have uh, sodium and chlorine, and you put them together and you get salt, and which is funny because sodium is a metal, and chlorine is a gas. But you put them together and you get salt. There are 92, Ninety-two naturally occurring elements. And of course, if you're not uh, too familiar with chemistry or if you feel like reviewing, it's always good to take notes. And each element has a unique symbol. I'm just going to put the chat up here. Okay, what is the symbol for carbon? You can write that in the chat. C, good. What is the symbol for um, sodium? Na, good. What is the symbol for magnesium? Mg, good. What is the symbol for iron? Fe, good. Yeah, so they, their roots are uh, Latin or German. So ferrous is iron, and that's a Latin derivative. So what is a compound? A compound is two or more elements occurring together in a fixed ratio. In a fixed ratio. And one of those is uh, sodium chloride. Sodium chloride or table salt. There's an equal number of sodium and chloride in this particular example. So each of these elements on their own have certain properties. Sodium has the metallic properties, chloride has the, chlorine has the 
uh, properties of being a gas, so volatile at a low temperature, for example. But together as a compound, they have what are known as emergent properties. Yeah, and it's, it's an edible, it's an edible salt. So where do we get table salt? Where do we get it to put on our tables? There are different ways of getting it. <laughs> the store, <laughs> that's awesome. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, Smarty, where, <laughs> where, where does the store get it from? <laughs> Are you going to say the supplier? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> okay. Uh, salt mines. Good. Yeah. Salt mines. And where, <laughs> where did that salt come from? In the salt mines. The sea. Absolutely. So ancient, ancient dried up seas. And there are many of those. Uh, if you look at the movement of the continents and the plates, um, there's loads of seas that have closed up, but much of the sea would remain on land or be closed off from the ocean as a whole, and then just eventually dry up. You can also get it by taking sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid, in which case you get water and salt. So that's pretty common. Uh, taking a base and an acid gives you water and salt, generally. That's a laborious way of getting table salt, though. Or you could take 2Na plus chloride, and you'd get NaCl. But you'd have to burn it. You'd have to burn the sodium in the presence of chloride in order for that to work. Also, a laborious kind of way of getting table salt. So essential elements of life are such elements as carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. They make up about 90. 96% of living matter. And there are a few others, a few others that make up about 4%. Calcium, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, sodium, chlorine, magnesium. Um, so we're talking about biochemistry. What kinds of larger molecules does one get in a cell from these various elements? What kinds of things, what kinds of elements in the cell? Yes, so oxygen is part of water. So we got lots of that. We got, you know, what is it? 70%, I think, of water. Um, I'm just going to pause for a second. What other kinds of macromolecules are made up of these elements? Sugars, good. What other things? Sucrose, yes. A disaccharide, excellent. What are some of the other macromolecules made up of these elements? Lipids, good, yes.
Nice. Um, how about DNA? DNA and RNA, proteins. Yeah, and, and a lot of these other uh, lesser but not less important elements make up our macromolecules as well. Like sulfur is very important when it, it creates uh, disulfide bonds um, in proteins. So they're very strong, they're very strong bonds. They keep proteins um, maintaining their shape. Trace elements are those elements that are ATP, good, yeah. Trace elements are those elements that are in a much lesser quantities. That's why they're called trace elements, uh, minute quantities, um, like iron and iodine. So trace elements such as iodine need to be present, of course. Even in plants, trace elements, very important for a plant function. So if there's a lack of nitrogen or phosphorus or potassium or magnesium, then you get these kinds of plant issues. So an element's properties depend on the structure of its atom. Each element consists of a certain kind of atom that is different from those of other elements. And an atom is the smallest unit of matter that still retains the properties of that element. All right, pausing again. Okay. Subatomic particles. We're not getting into quantum mechanics in this course, you might be happy to know. Um, but we're talking about the well known subatomic particles uh, neutrons, protons, and electrons. They are quite relevant. There's other ones, leptons, quarks, hadrons. Let's not talk about those. <laughs> not in this class anyway. Yeah, protons and neutrons are found in the atomic nucleus, of course. Electrons surround the nucleus in a kind of a cloud. Uh, moving at nearly the speed of light. Here's a simplified model. Here the electrons are shown as a cloud. And here, it's just shown as two blue spheres surrounding the nucleus. This will be helium. So there's really no other way of drawing it other than, you know, making it this seem like the electrons are close to the nucleus, but of course they're not. We know that already. Atomic number and atomic mass. The atoms of various elements differ in their number of subatomic particles. The atomic number is the number of protons. The number of protons is unique to each element. The mass number of an element is the sum of the protons plus the neutrons in the nucleus. It's an approximation of the atomic mass of an atom. Um, I say that it's an approximation because there are various isotopes of atoms. So in any given sample, there will be isotopes of an element. So the atomic mass won't be exactly the sum of the protons plus the neutrons as a result. Isotopes are atoms that have a different number of neutrons in their nucleus. So here, for example, is hydrogen, don't they have any? H2, 
deuterium has one. And this triple weight hydrogen tritium has two. And it turns out for hydrogen, if you have uh, one or two more neutrons, you could become a bomb. Yeah, that's how powerful that change is. Hydrogen bombs, they use fusion. They create enormous explosions. So some isotopes are radioactive. They're called radioisotopes. That means that they're unstable. Some isotopes are unstable. Some are quite stable. Some are unstable. And the decay of those isotopes, they will decay spontaneously into something stable over time. And we know the specific time of decay for lots of different elements. So the names of the radiation that is emitted by different elements, there's really only three kinds, uh, alpha, beta, or gamma rays. So I think I need to write this down here. Uh, what are they? An alpha particle is the same as the helium nucleus. So it's two protons and two neutrons. So they'll be ejected from the nucleus. Um, they don't penetrate the skin. A beta particle is an uh, electron that has been ejected. And a gamma particle, or it's not really a particle at all, gamma rays have no mass. They're just incredibly powerful. Gamma rays are very powerful. So those are radioisotopes, but you know, there's other kinds of isotopes, like nitrogen isotopes, for example. What's kind of, you know, isotopes are used ex extensively in medicine, but also in lots of other areas of biology. And one area is um, tracing animals, for example. This is a study that was um, about salmon. I don't know how much you know about salmon, but uh, they migrate from the ocean to rivers to spawn. And they do it by the thousands unless we overfish them, but um, there may be very many. These are all sockeye salmon. And when they spawn in rivers, they die. Yeah, they die and they become nutrients for their offspring. When the eggs hatch into alevins, they can, uh, yeah, they can provide nutrients for their young offspring, very small, but it increases productivity of the rivers. Yeah, so another thing that can prevent salmon from getting to their spawning grounds are dams. Yeah, there's like a, I'm not sure how many billions of dollars project there is on the Columbia River to try and mitigate that problem. Otherwise, they have to truck them over with trucks. But what, what was interesting about this study, it was about nitrogen isotopes. It turns out that the nitrogen in marine animals is a different isotope. It's N15, not N14. And so it's not, it's not a radioactive one, though. It doesn't decay. It just has an extra neutron. But what's interesting is that when the, when the salmon die in the rivers, animals like bears and eagles eat them. Sometimes they take them away and eat them. And so they decay in the forest. And when they decay in the forest, their nutrients become taken up by the trees.
And so researchers can go out with this. This is a core borer. Take a core out of the tree with rings. But they can examine the rings to see how much N15 as opposed to N14 is at that particular ring, which gives them the year because trees lay down rings every year. And that can give them an idea of the size of salmon runs on, at a particular year in the past. And carbon isotopes can tell, um, can tell you where certain people lived even due to the carbon isotopes in their diet. So plants have different signatures of carbon isotopes. You are what you eat. Um, how do we find out? We use a mass spectrometer. Mass spectrometers can, can determine uh, which elements are isotopes. So I'd like to do an exercise with you. It's a carbon dating exercise. Sorry, can you repeat one more time? Um, yeah. So the slide before with the mass spectrometer, we yeah. are able to tell the bone composition and then it, in respect to diet? You can tell whether or not your sample has a lot of nitrogen 15 as opposed to nitrogen 14. So that's all I know about mass spectrometers. Yeah. Okay. Mass spectrometers are used. So for example, the chap who, um, who was not even, I don't think he was a scientist, but he determined the age of the earth by getting the oldest rocks and finding uh, uranium, uranium isotopes, which decay into lead. And he could, by that sample, figure out the age of the earth because a uranium has a particular isotope of uranium has a half-life, which means that half of that sample will decay into lead in a certain number of, uh, of years. Yeah. So, but if you look at, does that help? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, so if you, if you put carbon dating into Google, I found out earlier, as I look at a bunch of dating sites, <laughs> it's quite funny. I was like, no, that's not what I'm looking for. Um, but where do, where do isotopes come from? Well, sometimes isotopes are ionized. Yeah, so here's nitrogen 14. And it's been hit by cosmic radiation, which causes it to lose a proton. Uh, the neutron is captured. And the carbon 12 or sorry, the neutron is captured and it now becomes carbon-14, carbon-14. As it's lost its proton, it's changed from nitrogen to carbon. Well, all three isotopes of carbon are very common. Carbon-12, that's the most common. Carbon-13 is rare, stable, however. Carbon-14 is also rare, but radioactive or a radioisotope, and it goes through beta decay. So following, following death, so, so we're taking in carbon all the time because we're eating and we're taking in whatever ratios of carbon 14 to carbon 12 to carbon 13 there are in our food. And carbon, you know, it, um, it cycles through our bodies. So we take it in in food and we end up breathing it out as carbon dioxide. It's, it's constantly cycling. So at any given time, we have a, a fairly particular ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 and carbon-13. But of course, when you die, you don't take on any more carbon. So the carbon-14 that is in your body starts to decay, uh, releasing a, a beta particle, it's called beta decay, into nitrogen-14. So if you were to look at that on a graph, 
So the blue part here, blue, this blue line here, that is, say you were, you were um, looking at carbon-14, which is what we're looking at here, the parent, the parent atom is carbon-14. The daughter atom is nitrogen-14. Nitrogen-14 is perfectly stable. So carbon-14 decays into nitrogen-14. Well, there's a very specific duration for this decay. Half of the sample will decay in 5,730 years. That is one half-life. So after another half-life, you just double 5,730. Uh, after 11,460 years, that sample will have decayed by half again. So you can graph that. If you started with 1,000 um, of carbon, you started with a, oh, I shouldn't do that in red. You start with 1,000. And you start with zero nitrogen. Then after one half-life, you'll have 500 uh, atoms of one and 500 gained of the other, of the daughter molecule. So I'd like to pause again now for an exercise. Other aspects of chemistry, for example, energy. Now the interesting thing about stability and energy is that the more unstable something is, the more energy it has, interestingly. So they're, the radioisotopes we were looking at, because they're radioactive and because they're unstable, it makes them radioactive. And, and it's their um, instability that gives them the energy to decay into something more stable. So I'm going to talk about the energy of electrons making life possible. And atoms' electrons vary in the amount of energy they possess. How can they possibly have different energies? Well, what energy is, is the capacity to change or to do work. And potential energy is the energy that matter possesses because of its location or its structure. The electrons of an atom differ in the amount of energy they possess because of the position of them relative to the nucleus. So a ball bouncing down a flight of stairs um, provides an analogy because the ball can only rest on each step, but not between steps. So just like an electron, an electron can't rest between shells, rather it's at one shell or another. So an electron can move between shells, but if it moves away from this more stable position, that's gonna require some energy. But, if it collapses and the electron moves closer towards the nucleus, that will release energy. And why is that important? Partly because the chemical behavior of an atom is defined by its electron configuration and distribution, um, not the nucleus. So the nuclei don't interact with other nuclei. And you can see the electron distribution for elements by looking at the periodic table, at least in this particular one. So helium, or sorry, hydrogen, hydrogen, one shell, one electron. The first shell can only hold two electrons. Helium has two. 
So since electrons match the number of protons, and protons increase as you go across the periodic table, lithium, for example, has three protons and three electrons. It has two shells because only two, shell, two electrons can exist in the first shell. Uh, beryllium has four protons, four electrons. So it has two electrons in its outer shell. And the outer shell is also known as the valence shell. And the electrons in the outer shell are known as the valence electrons. So they're the ones that interact with other um, atoms unless there are eight electrons in that outer shell. So what's interesting is that if you go across the periodic table, well, the number of protons increases in this direction. What increases in this direction? What has changed when we progress from the top of the periodic table down? What changes? Shelves. shelves. Yeah, so additional shells. But in this one column here, well, let's exclude helium, actually. How many electrons are in the valence shell? How many electrons are in the valence shell? Eight. Yeah, there are eight, and there will be eight in that entire column. And so that is why in that column, the elements have similar properties. Yeah, so a periodic table of the elements will tell you such things like, is it a non-metal? What kind of metal is it? If it's a metal, there's lots of metals, uh, halogens, or inert elements. Inert means stable, inert. So valence electrons are the outermost in the valence shell, and they determine the chemical behavior of an atom because they will interact with other electrons. An orbital is the three-dimensional space where electron is found 90% of the time. And there are, as far as I know, um, algorithms that can tell you or give you the probability of where that electron will be at any given time. So each electron shell um, consists of a specific number of orbitals. So it looks like this is an electron shell diagram. You know, it looks like they're just circular shells. But um, Sometimes they are, sometimes they are spherical, but sometimes they're in the shape of a, a dumbbell like that, the orbitals. So very different kinds of orbitals and shapes of orbitals. So the first shell can only hold two electrons. And after that, it can hold eight electrons. So uh, atoms, I should write this down perhaps, atoms with the same number of valence electrons have a similar chemical behavior. So an atom with a complete uh, valence shell is unreactive. But all the other atoms with, with non-filled shells are reactive. Uh, they'll form bonds. They'll try to complete their orbital, the octet rule. Um, and sometimes they'll be ions. 
So the formation and function of molecules depend on the chemical bonding between atoms. And those are the electrons that are making some of these bonds, in particular the covalent bonds. So covalent, think of valence in the word covalent, co together, the sharing of a pair of valence electrons. And the formation is such that the electrons are shared between the two atoms. So here are two hydrogen atoms. The single electron is being held in its orbital by its attraction to the proton in the nucleus, but there's only one. One electron in the shell isn't as stable as two. Therefore, two electrons become shared in a covalent bond that forms H2. which is the configuration of hydrogen in the atmosphere. Um, a molecule consists of two or more atoms held together by covalent bonds. Only one electron may be shared. That will be uh, a single bond, the sharing of one pair of electrons. A double bond is the sharing of two pairs of electrons and is stronger than a single bond. Here is hydrogen, two hydrogen atoms forming a single bond. This is the structural formula, a space filling model. Oxygen, two oxygen atoms sharing two pairs of electrons and a double bond. And if the atoms are the same, hydrogen and hydrogen and oxygen and oxygen, they will be, they will be um, equally electronegative and share the electrons evenly. Compounds are such that we said are two different atoms in a fixed ratio. Water, a very important one, H2O, water, which shows the oxygen sharing electrons with two hydrogen atoms. Oxygen has six electrons in its outer shell, so it's missing a couple. Methane has a one carbon atom and four hydrogen atoms. Why? Carbon only has four electrons in its outer valence shell. That's why carbon is the atom that allows life to occur because it can form so many different kinds of relationships with other atoms. Electronegativity is the attraction of a particular kind of atom for the electrons. Some uh, atoms like oxygen, for example, oxygen is really electronegative. Oxygen really pulls electrons towards itself. That's why oxygen is so reactive. That's why oxygen can can cause rust, for example, from iron. The more electronegative an atom is, the more strongly it pulls electrons toward itself. Um, a nonpolar bond, very similar electronegativities, they share the electron equally, like carbon dioxide, for example. But a polar covalent bond, the atoms have different electronegativities, so they share electrons unequally. That gives one, a slightly negative charge, and the other, a slightly positive charge. So th that gives this uh, water molecule, it makes it polar. Ionic bonds are when an atom strips electrons away from their bonding partners and creates ions. So ions are atoms with more or fewer electrons than usual. They are charged. An anion is a negatively charged ion. A cation is a positively charged ion. And I, an ionic bond is the attraction between anions and cations. So in this case, sodium, sodium has this, this wee little, um, 
electron in its outer shell quite unstable. It's not paired or anything. So it readily transfers over to chlorine. Then the chlorine becomes a chloride ion. It has an extra electron now that gives it a negative charge. And the sodium lost its electron, so it has an excess of protons, one proton not balanced out by that electron anymore. Ionic compounds are often called salts. They form crystals. There's other kinds of chemical bonds that are also very important for life forms. So those covalent bonds, for example, very important for the formation of proteins. Um, but there have to also be weak chemical bonds in life forms. So there's, there's a few that are very important. <laughs> the name's bond hydrogen bond. These hydrogen bonds are very important. They form when a hydrogen atom covalently bonded to one electronegative atom is attracted to another electronegative atom. So for example, uh, here's water with the slight positive charge on the hydrogen atoms attracted to ammonia with that slightly negative charge. That has a lot of implications in life. Um, what are those implications you may be asking yourself? Well, hydrogen bonds are implicated in, for example, forming hydrogen spheres around molecules. Uh, so for example, or atoms, so here's sodium, and then you get water. Well, all of the oxygen parts of water, this is hydrogen here, <laughs> since the oxygen is slightly negatively charged, it's going to dissolve the salt and separate the sodium. Sodium is easily dissolved in water once it forms crystals, easily dissolved. And the same thing happens with the chloride. Only with the chloride, of course, the hydrogen atoms are facing the chloride. Van der Waals are important also. This is a gecko. The gecko has these very interesting um, pads on its feet. And the reason they can walk on the ceiling is because their pads form temporary van der Waals bonds with molecules in the ceiling. But it's temporary, otherwise the gecko would be stuck there and wouldn't be able to move. <laughs> and then instead of going to eat the flies, the flies might eat it. So these weak chemical bonds, they reinforce the shapes of large molecules, such as proteins, for example. And they help molecules adhere to each other, like, for example, uh, DNA. So we'll be looking at DNA a little bit later on. Let's say you have C. These nitrogenous bases are held together by hydrogen bonds. Why is that important? Well, hydrogen bonds are very easily broken. They're very, they're very easily broken. So whenever your cells are replicating DNA, well, it's not so hard because uh, DNA polymerase comes along and it just, or helicase, and it just simply unzips the DNA quite easily because hydrogen bonds are weak enough for that. If they were stronger, you'd never be able to replicate DNA. The shape of a molecule, very important to its function, is determined by the position of its atoms' valence orbitals. 
In a covalent bond, the S and P orbitals may hybridize. They create very specific molecular shapes. Water, for example, creates this kind of shape. Methane. And those shapes end up being important to how they interact with other molecules. It determines how molecules recognize and respond to one another with specificity. For example, receptors for things like hormones must be very particular because they're specific to specific hormones. A testosterone receptor is specific to testosterone. Uh, a dopamine receptor is specific to dopamine. So I have a question which is, uh, are hydrogen bonds strong? That's a great question. So hydrogen bonds collectively, when there's millions of them, are strong. They're difficult to break as a collective. But singly, between water molecules, for example, the hydrogen bonds will break and form at a trillion times a second. And that's why water is liquid uh, between zero and 100. It's because those hydrogen bonds are or a break in a form, break in a form, a break in a form, a break in a form, a break in a form, <laughs> all the time. But collectively, it is hard to evaporate water, but that's because uh, water has a very high specific heat. And we're going to do a whole section on water. I'm very excited about it. So here are some specificity, specificities that are very interesting. Uh, this is your natural endorphins. And here is the part of that natural endorphin that binds to a receptor. And here is morphine, an opiate. Same shape. The molecule itself looks quite different, but it doesn't matter because that particular part of it that binds to a receptor will simply bind to the same receptor. So endorphin receptors on the surface of a brain cell recognize and bind to both. So we're talking about shapes, and I'd like to show you a video of this particular um, chat. So I'm going to pause again. Yeah, chemical reactions make and break chemical bonds. Uh, reactants. For example, like hydrogen and oxygen. This is the reaction and this is the product. So chemical reactions, we'll get into more when we talk about cellular respiration and photosynthesis. Yeah, I finished the whole 